Here we have uh, Dr. Vamsi Krishna. He's uh, going to kind of help moderate this case that we did. This is a dual prep case uh, we ended up having. So um, this is kind of my practice. You know, we cover multiple hospitals. So one of my colleagues asked me, hey, can you do this quick case at lunch I'm in between my clinic? Yeah, there's a little bit of calcium there, maybe a thrombus, um, you know, but it looks maybe uh, eccentric nodular calcification. It's a big right coronary artery. So here's a case. This is the from the diagnostic. Uh, shows a, a big RCA. Um, and uh, again, it, it, initially it looked like uh, probably calcification, maybe thrombus, but this is after marinating uh, overnight with uh, heparin. So uh, day number two, it's it's calcium here. So. Um, you know, this is one of these scenarios where you have eccentric nodular calcification. When do you think that IVL is adequate alone? And when do you kind of think you need rotational atherectomy? So Vamsi, what, what is your practice here? Yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty big imager. I, I like to, if, if the OCT or IVIS passes and, you know, then you want to identify some calcium algorithm. I think as you mentioned, this OCT calcium algorithm that you're showing here, we're, we're measuring is it more than 180 degrees or not? The depth and the thickness and the length all going to play a huge role. I think the reality is, is that when we look at calcium, not all calcium is the same, right? When you have concentric calcium, you have mild eccentric calcium, and then you have that nodular calcium. The biggest thwart to your lunch plan is if it's nodular eccentric calcium, where your balloons are going to rupture, you can't deliver devices, uh, and you're going to require multitude of types of preparatory stuff. So for me, I'm always like, if the IVIS doesn't pass, it almost 100% is nodular eccentric calcium. If I can't get the OCT to pass, almost always. So you're going to need to do some type of vessel prep, whether it's shockwave or using atherectomy plus shockwave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is this is this case exactly, right? The rule of fives again. Um, you know, looking at this case, there were two kind of huge Mount Everest-like lesions in this distal right coronary artery. So we decided to actually use rotational atherectomy here. Um, and, and this kind of goes back to um, the dual prep registry that so many times, you know, I, I'm not doing rotational atherectomy alone or orbital atherectomy alone. I'm finishing it off with IVL to get that deep calcification. I just find my results have been fantastic and I've been getting huge MSAs. What's your experience right. been with and I think, Arvind, to your point, I think it's like when we think of rotational orbital, we're thinking about sanding, we're thinking about really kind of changing the eccentricity of the calcium so that we're able to then get, uh, and then when we think about shockwave and things of this nature, we're ch thinking about compliance of the vessel. And so I think that's why this dual prep makes so much sense. We're sanding so we can get a circular, bigger MSA after we stent, and then we're using shockwave to get the bigger, more medial compliance changes to tr get true vessel growth. Yeah. So here's my case. This is actually with the balloon. Some the balloons were actually able to expand a little bit, but it it's one of those things where I kind of did this just to deliver the IVIS. So I, I did get some expansion from the balloon. Um and then I was actually able to deliver IVIS and it showed exactly what we talked about, that uh severe nodular eccentric calcification. So um, you know, this is uh, again kind of looking at their dual prep registry. Um you have uh Way more uh, no reflow, slow flow dissections in the uh, in the atherectomy group, and and this is why you know I, I think shockwave is such a great device. The complication rate and that no reflow rate yeah. and 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 all that is is so nice because you know you don't how many times have you needed a temp wire um, in a shockwave case? It's, I think I've heard of one one case where where it was needed, and but that was it. You know, patient didn't tolerate uh, balloon angioplasty, so. Uh, right. Yeah, this case, uh, again, I'm trying to um, be efficient here. The, the lab, uh, from my end, you know, doesn't do rotational atherectomy a lot anymore. And, and a lot of the labs that I work at, there's so much uh, inexperience with it. Has that been the same with you too? You know, and I think we have different practices, right? I'm, I'm in one facility where everyone kind of comes to me and you, you're traveling to numerous different, uh, different practices. So I, I agree, and me and you've chatted, like one lab has different devices than the other lab. So it makes it quite challenging, but real world. So I think that's also another power of Shockwave since it's usually now available everywhere versus, you know, a lot of people are not well trained in Rota um, and or CSI. And I feel, I find most labs are very nervous when it comes to atherectomy. Would, yeah, would you say that? 
Absolutely. And I, it's just, it's one of those things where even just the prep itself has, has changed. Yeah. You, you know, you, you're ready to go. I'm like, okay, let's, let's platform this, check our RPMs. And right. uh, oops, there's no gas in the tank or, or something. Right. It's just always the or same. They don't, they don't have the mail to mail, you know, connection for the drip and a yeah. pressure bag. It's, it's simple little things. And like you said, you're trying to do this case in 45 minutes or less. You're between 40 clinic patients mm -hmm. um, and it becomes very challenging. Yeah, and then the uh, the issue then is not having all the stuff ready, the you know temp wire ready if you need it, and and stuff like that. And sometimes I like to paste from the wire if I think I can can kind of get away with that if the patient's heart rate's okay and everything. Yeah. Basically, I'll kind of ground like either a needle or a suture at uh, on the patient, uh, put a red alligator clip in the front, and then um, uh, a black alligator clip in the back, and paste off the the actual rotor wire. And I've gotten away with that a few times too. Yeah, Rota Pace, and for anyone interested, there's a beautiful Jack study called Rota Pace that you can look at. Um, and we've kind of chatted, you know, people do different things. You can put aminophilin in the in the solution. You can give uh, some pre-dopamine if you really wanted to. But I think, you know, uh, the need for pacing now, there's a lot of other alternative measures. Yeah, so this case, they didn't have anything ready. So we ended up uh, doing rota five seconds uh, into rotational atherectomy. Patient had asystole. It was a mega right again, but uh, I needed to um, actually put a temp wire in, and then patient just got pretty sick. So I actually needed um, Impella um, to kind of support the case. And, and then she kind of needed to be intubated uh, after that because she just was not comfortable, a little nausea and everything like that. So... Um, this this kind of turned into a little bit more of a complicated case than than I initially planned, which happens. So uh, we ended up doing rota, um, and then uh, after this, we ended up taking our um, IVL and shockwave balloon and kind of moving through the um, uh, through the case. And and it's um, it's funny for this pulse management, right? I've I've really been looking more. I keep learning and from everyone, and and everyone does it differently. But if I kind of get really good balloon expansion, you know, I maybe save my pulses because I knew that from IVIS that this whole vessel is going to need um, IVL. So I ended up kind of focusing a little bit more pulses on uh, on the eccentric nodular calcification, and then kind of dragging it back. So with the IVIS, I'm kind of looking which areas I think are going to need the most uh, attention. Um, and, and kind of using it that way. But here, my pacemaker's flopping around. I didn't really need it at this point with the impellant. And, and after Rota, she, she tolerated uh, the case really well. Um, so here's our stent. Uh, you know, Ivis, Ivis sized uh, stent. Looks like um, we ended up using um, uh, three, five right. boros stents all the way, all throughout, and then uh, ended up post dilating. Um, and, and we ended up having a, a really good result. And then patient was able to get the impeller removed after the conclusion of the case, um, got extubated the next day. But I feel like these mega rights, uh, maybe I need a little bit more respect uh, in terms of the uh, temp wire with the yeah. rotor. Yeah, you know, I, th I think, you know, in my practice now also, when it comes to distal vessels, and if there, if the balloons are crossing, sometimes I will go in with the shockwave and I will attempt a shockwave first and then go back with the NC. And if it doesn't become nominal at, or in get an LAO, REO and fully inflate and they're still in debt, then consider Rhoda. I, I find the distal vessels in elderly patients, you know, I, I pay much more respect uh, to the complications associated with Rhoda and, and on those vessels, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I Got much more road, uh, IVL first and even in eccentric. And if there's a rupture of the balloon, my NC balloons are not yielding. And then now I feel like, um, you know, like you, you, you may have stopped and said, hey, it's not a lunchtime case and maybe modified it for the next morning. So would you have done IVL only in this? I would have, I would have first tried to IVL okay. first. And then gone through and then, the algorithm. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. if the IVL balloon ruptures, then mm -hmm. you know that eccentric nodular calcium is, is your problem. And then maybe you would have probably said maybe this is not the right facility if you needed to do whatever it, whatever situation you probably would have uh, given a lot of information for the timing of what's doing it you know so when i talk to my younger partners you know i always say like starting with nc balloons and shockwave is such a great tool because if things are not crossing not working you know that you're going to require you know things like rota or orbital or or maybe impella assisted etc and you want to set yourself up for um, for success 
and not not have to cancel clinic and all the other I'm sure things you had to do that day. <laughs> yeah, so so this kind of this is their dual prep registry again. It it just show that so often um, when we do use atherectomy, you can get really nice stent expansion if you use atherectomy plus IVL. It, it very infrequently am I using Rhoda alone anymore. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And and my my uh, labs because atherectomy is used so infrequently now. We kind of are getting rid of and pulling off orbital atherectomy off the shelf. Right. And Arvind and I were just chatting about you know the most recent studies that this got presented at TCT, which showed uh, minimal improvement with orbital atherectomy. And I think you know back to sizing RPMs on the rota. Uh, I think there's some all, you know positive things. To, for rota purposes and mainly for that eccentric sanding and then i think now with aero potentially coming out for shockwave and the new deliverability uh and the balloons being a little bit more resistant i think ivl is going to continue dominating the calcium space and even in some of these more uh, challenging cases let, let me ask you this so when you do rotational atherectomy what do you uh drill i i'm almost exclusively 1.5 millimeter burr unless it's like oh. some kind of left main um, right. What, yeah. Because what? we're mo mainly we're doing six French radial. So mm -hmm. one five, like you said, is probably, I would say, 75 percent. Mm -hmm. And then most and if I have to go bigger, um, you know, I'm doing seven French with one seven five and, and two oh two oh really only left main uh, one seven five for the bigger RCAs and, you know, Prox LED if, if they're larger than four millimeters. But I think you're you're right. The one five is really now with Shockwave. We can go smaller size because we're really just trying to sand yeah. uh, and then use a shock. Has that changed create. the RPMs you use? Yeah. Yes. Great point. So if I, I if if I know it's very very eccentric tight, I will go 180,000 RPM. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm going small, well, slightly smaller, and then if, uh, if otherwise my standard is 160, mm -hmm. but I go 180 when I know I'm going to have to create a little bit larger lumen. Yeah, I've been going 160 now. Before I was going 180, now I'm going 160,000 RPMs. Um, oh. And I'm just trying to make a little bit of a channel. But if, exactly. like you said, if I can't... Get really mm -hmm. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm really leaning on it, you know, pecking away and it's not making any progress, then I'll, then I'll increase the rate to 180. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, I think, you know, we, we, when we look at the OCT registries and we look at IBIS registries, what we notice and what's the most glaring thing is that 25 to 35 percent of all PCIs have at least moderate calcium? So to me, it's like there's calcium everywhere in a lot of what we're doing, and it's the bane of interventional cardiology previously. And then now we have tools, and now like you're, what I think you're illustrating here, Arvin, is that like you're going to require some form of calcium modification, and that even if you did rota, you're still not breaking up the medial calcification, and that strategies like using uh, rota plus shockwave. Uh, probably should be standard if you're, you're definitely image. And most of the time when you image, you know, rule of fives is almost always present. <laughs> no, totally right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Arvin.